Please, let's welcome Robert Rosencrantz to the stage. Hi, Bob. So, Bob, one thing we wanted to clarify, um, the, the, the motion language is very tight, three words, shorter than we normally have. It sounds very obvious, but we, we mean something specific when we say legalize assisted suicide, whose meaning could be more ambiguous than it sounds. Well, I think what we mean is legalize physician assisted suicide. Okay, we want to be clear about that because so, it's no, not that's, broadly that's euthanasia. That's what we're talking about. Um, and the, the other thing we were chatting backstage beforehand is sort of interesting perspective that you have uh, on this topic. You, you know, you've, you've done a lot of things in your, you've got, had a number of careers behind you, and you were talking about that Number one, you've been an insurance executive, and number two, you've been a lawyer. And you looking at this topic, those two perspectives gave you a kind of interesting insight on this. So let's start, let's start with the insurance executive side of it first. Well, uh, our insurance company insures about 8% of the U.S. Uh, labor force against catastrophic injuries at work. Uh, so I see a lot of cases of people who are really, really seriously injured. I saw one uh, uh, just last week of somebody who is now a quadriplegic uh, and going to be bedridden for the rest of their lives. It's a 30-year-old who has a life expectancy of 30 years. And a person like that who might decide that life is not worth living uh, cannot end it except with assistance, and yet the statute doesn't really cover them. The statutes, at least in Oregon and, and Washington, uh, only refer to uh, terminally ill. So in some ways, uh, you know, the, the, the statutory issue is narrower than what I think might uh, be the issues that, uh, that ought to be discussed tonight. And that gets to the lawyer side of your experience. You, you went and sat down and read the statute, and you came back with some interesting responses. Well, the, the other, the other th requirement of the statute besides uh, terminal illness is that a person has to be capable of making a decision. And that term capable is not defined. Uh, and indeed, they talk about, uh, the statute talks about an ability to communicate their decision in ways that imply that the person is barely able to communicate at all. So, uh, you know, maybe just shaking their head or squeezing a hand or blinking an eye or something like that. Which the implication is that it would be very, very hard to actually assess their mental acuity or their ability to, to make these critical decisions. So that, that just struck me as a lawyer as a, uh, a pretty uh, troublesome bit of, of legal draftsmanship in this question of, of who is capable legally of deciding whether to in, in, invoke uh, the statute for legally assisted so, suicide. So what's interesting in this one is there's this clash of principles that runs right into practicalities and, and the practicalities, the details are, leave all sorts of room for interpretation. I mean, the more you think about this, the more complicated it gets. And it is a very, very highly emotional issue for a lot of people, and it's going to touch their lives in very profound ways. But we're talking about legalizing something, which means passing a statute, and therefore you've got to pay some attention to the language of that statute and what the limitations are and what the ambiguities are. Well, we do have four debaters who are very, very well versed in this, and they are passionate about it, so let's welcome them to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, our debaters. <laughs> 